Hey up everyone, welcome to episode 10 of Get Out, Look Up, an astronomy show. So what's going on in the world of space land, what's happening out there? Right, so we've talked about this before, <coughs> about the, the, the origin of life, how did life start on Earth, did it did it start on Earth, or did it come from outside what we call exogenesis? Um, we've talked about the possibility of life on other worlds, possible microbial life that lives on Mars. We think that because of changes in methane and oxygen levels that are generally associated with life. We've talked about Encelada and Europa, which are both moons of Jupiter. These are ice worlds that have got liquid water that we've seen through the different probes that we've sent up there, the Juno probe, the Cassini probe. Both confirmed that there's liquid water there. So there is a possibility of life out there, even within our own solar system, not even out there in the wider space. Um, it's generally considered that life probably started on Earth. Um, there are certain things that are required for life like water we also have things like rna that's like this precursors and we also have it with dna we have amino acids and nucleotides and things like this right that that we think were part of the like primordial soup that that where life formed right and so one of the arguments against exogenesis this idea that life came from somewhere else so with, with like part of the argument is that it could have come from comets because comets are ice worlds so the the life would have had access to water on a comet and then that crashed into earth and it's brought life from outside so so this could happen in, in in numerous ways i mean we have a lot of like meteorites in Britain, on earth that have actually from mars they're chunks of mars that have been knocked off mars and it's made its way through the solar system to us so the idea that like a part of a planet could get knocked off into space, that's quite a common thing. We see that. We've seen that before. When asteroids and comets crash in, they eject lots of material back out into space. So life could cling to that. We've found bacteria and stuff that are capable of living in the vacuum of space. So it's not a crazy idea. Um, but we found all the necessities for life on comets and on meteorites before, apart from another important ingredient, sugars. Sugars have always been absent. We've never found sugars before on an asteroid or on a meteorite. Um, and so the idea of exogenesis seemed unlikely because if sugars can't... can't um, see, sugars are quite fr fragile and volatile compounds. They easily break down. Um, and so, like, travelling through space, we considered was probably a little bit too much. There was too much radiation or something that was stopping the sugars from um, maintaining their coherence and stuff. Um, but anyhow, right, we've, we've just found the first examples, and actually we found two different examples of meteorites, both of them found in Australia. No, one in Australia, one in Antarctica, sorry. Um, and we found, we found sugars on them for the first time ever. So, so this proves that sugars can can transfer through throughout space, and now we found all the ingredients that are necessary for life. We found them on meteorites, um, on comets as well. So, so that's kind of interesting. That's kind of interesting. This keeps this whole idea of exogenesis alive. Um, obviously, we don't know. We don't know, but 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 it looks like it could be quite possible. So, so yeah, the search for life continues, but we're still we're seeing all the building blocks and stuff that we need. It's quite possible for them to travel through space and to have landed on Earth. So, it's pretty good, right? So, right. So, uh, and as I've said loads of times, there's loads of mysteries, right? We're a very young species. We don't know a jack shit, right? We're just still learning. We haven't even looked at the entire fucking universe yet. Do you know what I mean? Like, we're still young. There's still lots of things out there that confuse the fuck out of us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like these gamma ray burst things that we keep seeing happening all over. We've got no idea what the fuck's causing that. Do you know what I mean? So there's lots of things out there. Right, so one of the things is this, there's this theory that's called Planet Nine. Right. 
So we've talked about the Kuiper Belt a lot of times. So we've got the Sun, and then we've got the rocky planets up to Mars. Then we've got the asteroid belt in between Mars and Jupiter. Then we've got the gas giants up until Neptune, and then everything beyond that we call trans-Neptune, right? But then after Neptune, we've got the Kuiper Belt, which is almost the same as the asteroid belt. It's just a lot further out and a lot bigger. It's basically just rock. There's loads of rock and stuff there. There's not much ice. Ice is generally from a bit further out. The next bit, we've got Kuiper Belt, then the Earth Cloud. That's ice. But but generally in the Kuiper Belt, um, it's rocky. Um, and we often think of like the meteorite, uh, the, the um, asteroid belt and the Kuiper Belt as being planets that haven't yet formed. So like when we look at the early solar system, we see lots of these, it's just full of rocks. But over time, these rocks clump together and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then they, as they get bigger, their mass increases. And so their gravity increases. So they start pulling more and more and more things in and it carries on and carries on. And as it's going round the, in an orbit around the sun, it clears out that path and everything sticks together. And that's how, that's how planets form, yeah. So the, the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt look like areas where, where that's still yet to happen or, or, or certainly they haven't cleared out the area. So we've got like what we call dwarf planets. We've got like Cirrus in the asteroid belt and we've got Pluto in the, Kui in the Kuiper belt. And these are, these are fairly large things where this clumping has happened. It's just it hasn't cleared out its orbit. There's still a load of shit out there. Do you know what I mean? Um, but we've been, we've been studying the Kuiper belt a lot more recently. Uh, we've sent probes out there to have a look at Pluto and its moon, um, and we, we've just found another um, dwarf planet further out than Pluto. It's the furthest thing that we've studied, and we've got a little probe that's out there. We've got loads of probes out there looking at shit. But anyway, right, so we've been studying the Kuiper Belt fairly intensively, but there's some weird shit going on with the Kuiper Belt, right? And it's all to do with the tilts of things and the orbits. It seems like... What it seems like is that there's something else out there, further out in the Oak Cloud, possibly. Maybe even possibly further out than the Oak Cloud, if it's much bigger than that. Um, because what we see is that it looks like there's something tugging on these things, like Pluto, so it looks like something's tugging it. And we put in the maths and we do the calculation. And it, sh and it shows that like one thing that could explain this is if there's another planet out there, and it would be a rather large planet, it would be much bigger than Earth, uh, and that would, that would make the calculations work. And so for the longest time, people have been trying to find this planet 9 um, um, without success, I mean, it must be said. But it seems to be... Seems to be a massive smoking gun in the solar system that points to the existence of this thing, right? So, so as I say, we've been studying this for quite some time now. Um, and some of the researchers have put forward another alternative explanation for this. And that is that there's a really, really tiny black hole. Now, we've talked about supermassive black holes that are at the centre of galaxies and that help to form the shapes of galaxies through their massive fucking gravitational well and stuff. But black holes come in all kinds of sizes. Um, you can have really small black holes. It's all about the density of it and how much mass is, con is like squashed into that small space. And that's what defines a black hole. But like, there's no size limits to it. We see some, some of the largest things that exist in the universe are actually black holes, constantly pulling in lots of matter into them, squashing them into singularities and stuff. And so we see lots of different kinds of black holes. So basically that they've, um, they've, um, they've come to the conclusion that this, this, um, That, that this tugging of the things that are happening in the Kuiper belt could be caused by a black hole. Now, it wouldn't be a very large black hole. The calculations is that it would probably about be about 15 times the size of the Earth. So, whatever. In comparison to the size of normal black holes, it's, it's rather a small one, right? So they're calling it a baby black hole. But whatever, it's kind of interesting because we're just finding new techniques to be able to discover black holes. 
Because you're usually looking at like magnetic fields and stuff that like indicate that they're there. The Chinese have just come up with a new method for finding black holes. So, so it'd be quite interesting because we think that there should be a lot more black holes in our galaxy than what we're actually seeing right now. So the existence of this black hole is not something controversial, do you know what I mean? We think that there probably are a lot of black holes, some of them quite small, that are in the, that are in the Milky Way. But it's an interesting thing that, because you can, it's either a massive planet or a very small black hole, do you know what I mean? But whatever, we're still looking out for this, we're still trying to find this, we're still trying to discover what the hell is causing all this tugging and stuff that's going on out there. But yeah, it might be a black hole, it might be a black hole. Right, so another thing about black holes, right, so I was kind of looking at like, you know, the possibility of going out into interstellar, go from our star to another star. Now we're talking about massive distances here. This is the problem that humans would have about traveling there, yeah? Is that they're really, really far away and like traveling at the fastest that we possibly could, um, it would take us hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years to get to like Alpha Centauri, which is the closest star to us. So it's always been a bit of a just a dream, really, about how the hell can we do this? And there are certain there are certain theories about how we could do this. There's a thing called an EM drive, which seems to get to well, sub speed, light speed, but but like really, really fast. There's also this idea of using lasers to fire on a craft and push that further out. There's also theories about using the solar wind, putting up sails, almost like a sailboat that catches the solar wind, and then that could push us further out. We've got nuclear drives. We've got all kinds of um, propulsions and stuff that that are being talked about. But I came across this 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 idea that was being put forward about it, which I thought was kind of a bit mind-blowing, really. <laughs> so basically, this is called a Kyber Blitz drive, right? And essentially what this thing does is it uses, um, it uses laser, right? So usually a black hole is formed by matter falling in on itself and under intense gravitational waves, right? This idea is to create a black hole, but using laser, using light, and folding la laser and light and concentrations of it into it to create a black hole, right? Theoretically, this is possible to be able to do this. And the idea is that, um, so, and a black hole, um, it used to be thought that nothing could escape from a black hole, right? But then Stephen Hawking um, re uh, produced a paper that proved that actually radiation can escape, and the radiation is named after him. It's called Hawking's radiation, right? So the idea is that you, you create this black hole and which emits loads of radiation, and then you, you use that radiation as a fuel source, right? And... The calculations show that we can get to 0 0.1 c, so c is the speed of light. So 0 0.1, yeah, it's not quite speed of light, but anyhow, it's impossible to get to speed of light. But, but 0 0.1 is actually very, 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 very fucking fast. Absolutely ridiculously fast. Right. Um, now, the thing is that the amount of energy that would be produced by this black hole is like 10,000 times the entire amount of energy that's used on Earth right now. So this is a massive thing, do you know what I mean? And it is only theoretical at the moment, but it, using this and travelling at 0 0.1 C would get us to Alpha Centauri in 3.5 years. Like, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whatever. Three and a half years to get to Alpha Centauri. Oh my God, whatever. But anyhow, right? So it is only theoretical. But the Chinese uh, are experimenting with this to see whether it's a possibility. What's also quite interesting is that this method of propulsion is actually what the Romulans in Star Trek use. <laughs> so how awesome would it be if we travelled to the stars using Romulan technology? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so Kuba Blitzer Drive using a black hole. That's an awesome, that's an awesome idea. It's an awesome idea. So, so yeah, I was quite, I was quite taken aback by that. Well, that was really, really good, good idea of how to do it using Hawking radiation. That was quite cool. I'm sure the guy would be well chuffed about that.
Uh. Right, so we've talked about Jupiter before. I've told you about some observa observations that I have to love it, where you can see striations and stuff. But one of the one of the big things that you want to see if you look at Jupiter is the giant red spot. So this is a massive, massive storm that's going on on Jupiter. And when you look at it through a telescope, like so, like let's so, say so that's the size of Jupiter, this spot is like that, it's massive, it's massive. It takes up maybe a quarter of the size of Jupiter and given that Jupiter is almost a star, it's almost as big as the sun, that's a massive storm, <laughs> that's a massive storm. And we've, like, Jupiter was one of the first things that was observed, like Galileo, looking at Jupiter, saw what's called the Galilean moons, so we've talked about them, Io, Europa, Encelada, um, yeah, I think they're the only ones that we've talked about, but there's five of them. Now, when you look at Jupiter, even through binoculars, you can see these stars, you can see these moons, and they move ridiculously quick. If you look, and then you come back an hour later and have a look, the moons will be in different places, do you know what I mean? It's proper awesome. And that was when Galileo saw that, he realised that these moons were going round Jupiter, and therefore not everything, not everything orbited the Earth, there were things that orbited other things, and that was how the whole heliocentric view, the idea that the sun's at the center of the solar system came about through Galileo watching these these storms. And right, so from the very beginning of looking at Jupiter, this storm, this great red spot has been there. It's been there for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, right? But recently we've been, because we've, um, we've got we've got a spacecraft that's, that's around Jupiter. It's called Juno. It went up there in like 2016. Um, uh, so we've got constant information coming back from it. So we've been monitoring it quite closely since 2016. And in the last three years, it's getting, it got smaller, right? So there was a bit of fear that maybe this it was going to disappear, that it might fizzle out or whatever, or the storm might be coming to an end and stuff like that. But anyhow, we've realised that actually, actually, it's not getting smaller at all. And that the, the energy within the centre of the storm is exactly the same. All that's happening is that on the outside, there's much more, because it's a fluid, so there's fluid dynamics going on here. And what's happening is just that the edges of it are being broken down by the other things, but it's not being dissipated, it's being concentrated further into the storm. So all the storm is it's smaller, but it's just as intense as what it was. So it doesn't look like it's going to die out, which is quite interesting because I have never seen it. I, I, I must have done dozens and dozens and dozens of observations of Jupiter and I have never seen the red spot. Every time I look at Jupiter, the red spot is on the back of the planet and I can't see it. And so, I might be able to still see it because it's still going to be there. So that's kind of cool, that's kind of cool. It's one of the amazing things that like whatever, when you're telling people to get out and look up, you tell them, go look at the red spot, man, it's proper awesome. Um, and so I've heard, because I haven't seen it myself, but you can actually see it moving in real time. It's kind of cool watching Jupiter because it's got all these different bands of like different strata of different like um, gases and stuff that come in together and, and they, they circle in different directions and there's a massive interplay that goes on with it. When you're observing it, you can you can see it in real time. You can see these clouds and stuff moving across the surface. It's constantly changing. It's a beautiful thing. I absolutely love looking Jupiter. That's why I've looked, that's why I've looked at it so many times. It is just the most amazing thing to see. So yeah, the red spot's still gonna be there. So that's good news. That's good news. Right. So we've talked about this before as well about the International Space Station. So basically the International Space Station is just one massive laboratory that we've put up into space. What we do there is science. We take things up there, we do experiments, we grow plants, we do all sorts of other things up there. We take bacteria up there, we look at diseases and infections and see how, how does being in space affect him, right? So we've got astronauts up there who are basically scientists. They're just up there to do science, yeah, whatever. Um, 
But also, the, the astronauts are basically the subjects of experiments as well. We do experiments on them. But we do a lot of monitoring. We, we want to find out what, what effects does being in space have on the human body, right? And we've talked about this before in other, in other programs about different things that they've found out about how it affects the brain, how it affects the circulatory system, how it affects the immune system, how it affects the bacteria that live in our gut. We've talked about these before, have a look on, on, on previous episodes, right? But there's been some new research that's just come out now as well. So they've been doing a lot of uh, tests on like the digestive system in space and how that affects it. So they're looking at the biome, the like bacteria and stuff that they've been at gut. So they've been doing quite a lot of research in there, and what they've found out is that being in space um, creates what's called leaky gut. So it, in the inside of our gut, we've got a layer on the inside, which is basically there to... So we, we consume bacteria everywhere. It grows all over us, and it grows all on the inside of our body. Our bodies are just full of bacteria, right? But... It stays within certain places within the body. So it basically stays within the digestive tract. Right? You're not going to find any bacteria in your heart or your lungs, but you'll find it all in your digestive system because it goes through our body. So it's got an opening here so bacteria can get in and then it comes out at the other end, right? But whatever, right, we're completely covered in bacteria. And but the inside of our gut has got this kind of like mucus stuff, which is there to stop bacteria passing through the cell walls and getting into the other parts of our body, right? Which, where it can cause all kinds of problems. Because when, it live, when it's in the digestive system, we've got other, back, we've, got, we've got good and bad bacteria. And the good bacteria can fight back against the bad bacteria. But if the bad bacteria gets into our body, there's no good bacteria to fight it off. And it can, get, it can be much more of a serious infection that you can get from it. Anyhow, they found that by being in space, that these cells on the mucous membrane get thinned out. Which means it's much more easier for bacteria to pass through. Um, and so they found that the, the cell membranes are compromised just by going into space. So... Again, right, the, all these things about how, how astronauts are affected by space, it's all basically about going to Mars, right? Going to Mars is going to take us a long, long time, which means there's going to be astronauts traveling all that way in space for, for, for a long time. So we need to know how this is going to affect them. Do you know what I mean? We don't want them to get on Mars and fall to pieces because all the bones are all brittle and stuff. Do you know what I mean? And whatever, they don't they suddenly have no use for their arms. Or whatever, do you know what I mean? We need to know what's going to happen. If they're going to get there, we don't want them to get sick and ill because whatever, they're on Mars. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> whatever. But whatever, so this is interesting work and it's important work that's being done here. So whatever, don't know how they're going to counter this. This is the thing, is we seem to be finding problems and now we've got to try and find solutions to these problems, do you know what I mean? So, so whatever, that's another, that's another uh, problem that they've found with living in space. Right, so that's your news, you're up to date on what's going on in space land, but you know what, you keep telling me, get out and look up, what am I going to see if I get out there? Well, hang on, right, calm down, I'll tell you what you're going to see if you look out there. Right, so, we've talked about meteor showers many times before. Um, meteor showers are basically formed when asteroids or comets, it's usually comets, but sometimes it's asteroids. So, comets come from what's called the Oort cloud, which is, is outside of the Kuiper belt, and it's just a collection of ice. It's a massive, massive area within the solar system. The size of the of the Earth cloud is about the same as the size of the rest of the solar system. So it's quite a big thing. There's mainly ice rocks and stuff there. And a lot of them get knocked out as things bash into one another. It knocks them out and then it falls into the gravity well of the sun and, and hurtles towards the sun, right? Now these are ice. So as it comes closer to the sun, it starts to melt. Yeah, and then they, they always end up with this massive tail that comes off them because the solar wind, which I've talked about before, so you've got the sun that's constantly pumping out plasma, which is extremely high temperature gases, which creates another state of matter called plasma. 
And as this plasma is being ejected constantly out of the sun, it creates what's called the solar wind. And it has the same kind of effect as the wind does on Earth. So it can push against things and stuff like the wind does. And as it pushes against this rock, it heats it up and that releases gases, which then forms a tail, right? So sometimes these comets come within the orbit of the Earth. They come they cut across it. Sometimes they can crash into the Earth. Do you know what I mean? Um, if like Jupiter or the moon haven't cleared it out of its way, they can and have before crashed into the Earth. But sometimes they just cross our orbit and then what happens is you've got a stream of all this stuff that's been kicked off it, which was part of the tail, which is now just there hanging in space. Yeah. And then what happens is the Earth moves through this cloud and all those little bits get attracted by Earth's gravity and fall to Earth. And as it hits our atmosphere, we get these pew, 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 pew meteorites. So that's what causes meteorite showers, right? So like I said, most of these are caused by comets, right? But occasionally we get meteorites. So meteorites are made from rock, not from ice. But sometimes they have ice mixed in with them. And sometimes they're made from rock that hasn't been compact. It's still quite brittle and it's got little tiny bits of sand on it or whatever. It hasn't compressed. There's not enough gravity to pull it all together. So so these little tiny bits get knocked off. Yeah. And so, so sometimes you can get meteorites that have got tails as well. Um, and tonight, tonight is the star of what's called the Geminid meteor shower. This is one of the best. This is one of the best. This, this is, you're going to get a lot of them, right? But it's only just starting now, right? And we're going to have this for like about four weeks. The peak isn't until December 13th or 14th. So I'll probably mention it again in another show and remind you of it. But it's just starting right now. It's just starting. So if you go out and you look up, you don't need any equipment. You don't need binoculars. You don't need a telescope. You just need your eyes. Go out, go lay down on your back, look up at the sky. See the wonder before you and watch a load of fucking meteorites. They're awesome, man. They're awesome. They're awesome. So get out and have a look. Geminid, right? Oh, so basically it's going to be in the northwest. So I've shown you Gemini. I showed you the constellation Gemini in a previous show. It just looks like two people laid down on top of one another like this. Yeah, you can see their arms and their legs and stuff. So just best like that. Yeah. It's quite low. Northwest, look in that general direction, and that's where they will appear to come from. They will appear to come from the constellation of Gemini, which is why they call the Geminid meteor around shower. So go, go have a check at that. Right, so I've been saying, I've been I've said before about Jupiter and Venus, yeah. So right now they're ridiculously ridiculously close to one another. They're basically on top of one another. You couldn't put your fist between them. Right, it's more like two fingers between them that's how close they are right now so you've got the third largest thing in the sky and the fourth largest thing in the sky basically on top of one another you can't miss it you can't possibly miss it right so it's in the south right it's fairly low down it's about quarter of the way up the sky so they're really really close together but what's interesting about tonight and tomorrow is that in the same view, if you're looking at that and you go north west from it, maybe about four fists full to northwest, you'll see Saturn as well. So, in just one view, you will see three different planets. And they're kind of cool because they're totally fucking different from one another. They don't, all three of them look completely different to one another. Saturn looks really bright, even though it's not as bright as the other two. It looks really bright. Venus is just like a bright white. And also Venus has like phases, like the moon. So you get like crescents and stuff on it. If you've got binoculars, you'll be able to see the crescents. It's generally always a crescent. I've never seen it at full Venus. But whatever, it's a cool, it's a cool conjugation of the three of them together. So get out and have a look at them because they're pretty awesome. It's always good looking at fucking stars. Uh, looking at planets, to be honest. Right, so, so if you go out and you look south, you'll see this extremely bright star, right? But w one thing you might notice is that there's nothing else anywhere near it. It's just there in the sky on its own. So usually things are fairly close together in the sky, do you know what I mean? Like you've got constellations basically sitting on top of one another like this. It's all a mishmash of things. 
But this star seems to have nothing else around it at all. And it's called the solitary one because there's nothing else around it. And the closest thing to it is 40 degrees away. So this is quite clearly the thing with nothing else around it in the sky. It's just kind of cool to see. It's called, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, Formald Formalhut. 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 And it's a solitary one. It's all on its own out there, poor thing. Go and say hello to it. Go and make it feel better. Right, so, uh, we've seen this planet before, but it's out again now. It's quite bright. It's fairly close to us. Like, so, like, the orbits around the sun, they're not circles. You know, they make ovals. So planets move closer and further away from it. And the planets themselves move closer and further away from it. And so there's periods when planets are closer to us, and that's the best time to go out and observe them, yeah. So Mercury is, is coming into this position where it's getting much closer to Earth, so you can see it quite well. So, you should be able to see this with, your, with the naked eye. It'll be fairly dim. It's not a very bright thing. Out in the southwest, go out, and you need to go out in the morning. It's only going to be up for about four hours in the morning, and then it'll set, so... Early morning, get up, make your breakfast, go out and look at Mercury. Why would you not want to do that? Why would you not want to do that? Right, so last thing. Right, on the 28th, there's going to be a kind of interesting conjugation between Saturn and the Moon. So the Moon will be a very thin crescent like this, yeah. But Saturn will seem to appear to sit right on the top of the Moon. Right, <clears throat> So that's going to be the 28th, and that should be up all night, so you should be able to see that. So that's Saturn and the Moon in a conjugation. Get out and look up.